Hey, how are you guys doing? Welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. Welcome to the show. Um, I'm really looking forward, really excited together with my co-host Stephanie von Jan to have a uh, really thrilling, exciting educational talk with Janine. Her Twitter handle is j 9 Rom, that's R O E M. Check out on, on Twitter. You know, in today's age and times with systematic surveillance, uh, breach of privacy, leakage of personal information and data, uh, you know, systematic theft by central banks, nation states, governments, it's just sometimes beyond words, beyond description. But anyway, without further ado, this is my talk, our talk, uh, together with my co host Stephanie von Jan with Janine on Bitcoin, privacy investigative journalism have fun and let me know your questions afterwards hope you're gonna enjoy this as much as we do recording now well welcome to the show to the total bitcoin podcast show our very special guest is janine with her twitter handle j9 room on twitter and my special co-host is stephanie von jan thanks so much for your time both of you thanks for coming to my show Hello. how are you doing <laughs> Good. Thank you. All right. Um, Janine, I met you at the Lightning Conference in Berlin. I was really impressed because I had the pleasure of talking to you. Unfortunately, the settings, the conditions were not really perfect to make a personal interview. And now we finally made it at least, you know, online. But I still want to make it up for and do a personal interview whenever whenever you're in Austria or maybe we could be or I could be. I mean, you're Stephanie, you're in Germany anyway. So, um, and you are, to me, in my eyes, you're one of the, uh, you know, remnants. You, uh, you know, one of the remnants of the almost extinct species of investigative journalists or investigative journalism, because there's hardly any real, real, you know, deep core, uh, high quality, you know, uh, uh, deeply researched investigative journalism. So. Can you tell a little bit, maybe our viewers and listeners, a little bit about your background, how you came, you know, to, uh, to specialize on privacy uh, or can I call it like investigative journalism and Bitcoin and all these, you know, other uh, related matters? Yeah, my my inch, I've had um, an interest in being a journalist for a very long time. It's definitely a lot longer than I've had an interest in in Bitcoin or even technology in general. Um, but my interest in journalism and Bitcoin are kind of related because I basically, I mean, I decided I wanted to be a journalist um, much earlier, but my interest in being the type of investigative journalist that I am trying to be, um, which, you know, I, I appreciate saying that it's, I'm part of an extinct class or almost extinct class, which on the one hand is a bit scary because I wish there were more people that were doing this. Um, and I wouldn't even say that I'm the best at what I do. Um, I have a lot of um, people that do a lot of great work and have a lot, have had a lot greater influence on the world than I have um, that do a great job. But um, the way that I discovered Bitcoin actually, well, I heard about it a few times, um, just, you know, randomly it would be mentioned on the news or something. And then I read about it in the book, uh, Cypherpunks, um, that was basically a conversation between Julian Assange and a bunch of other people who consider themselves to be cypherpunks. And for anyone who doesn't know what a cypherpunk is, it's fundamentally a person who believes that cryptography which is the um, practice of secret writing using math to obscure uh, conversations uh, and other forms of content, um, that it has uh, the ability to uh, have great social and political impact, hopefully towards a world where uh, people are able to have greater control over uh, their information and um, possibly protect themselves from uh, adversaries of all sizes. And so I read about Bitcoin in that book, and at the time I didn't have um, I didn't have that much interest in money. I didn't really understand the impact of money and the way that monetary systems are structured and how that impacts our daily life. And so I didn't really pay attention to Bitcoin when I first read that book. But then I read it again a bit later, I think in. 2014-ish, 2013, 2014, and uh, that was when I realized that 
well, actually this thing had a really great impact because the fact that, like, because the primary author of the book was Joan Assange, and one of the reasons that WikiLeaks uh, was able to survive was because they started taking Bitcoin donations during their banking blockade. And so I made the connection between the ability for true investigative journalism to be sustainable and to just even survive under uh, similar conditions, um, but not quite to the extent of what WikiLeaks faces in terms of you not only have other members of the press coming after you, but you have all forms of private investigators, um, analysis firms, intelligence agencies, governments, um, all of those actors coming after you. How do you survive that kind of attack if a lot of those people have influence over the monetary system itself and your ability to get paid and to live. Um, so that was um, the primary re reason that I got interested in Bitcoin was just the, the thought of like, well, if I'm going to be in this field, um, I need to be able to protect myself. And I, and I think other, sh other people should be able to protect themselves. Um, and of course that's, that's uh, whether you're, you know, a small journalist who, you know, you're not, <laughs> you're not being attacked by a nation state or anything like that, but maybe you just have a lot of people who don't like your writing or they're threatened by your writing and they, you know, call up PayPal that you may be using to receive funds and they're like, hey, I don't like this person, um, you know, maybe, maybe they broke a small obscure rule in your terms of service, uh, you should kick them off. And uh, they do sometimes. And that's a big threat to journalists who are using centralized payment providers. Wow, yeah. And you know, one of my uh, top priorities and our, or also uh, Stephanie's, I would uh, also talk for her, is that uh, we want to break things down and, and like, what does it mean for the end user? Like for the, uh, you know, for the average user out there, because your, your articles are like, are like super like succinct and really, I mean, superbly investigated. Uh, do you want to like, uh, be, before we sh uh, start off with your question, Stephanie, do you want to like, um, um, Tell tell us a little bit about your your newsletter that you you, uh, you know you uh, recently released since June. Uh, what would really um, interest me? There are two topics which I want to go into. Is that um, the um, the Europol cybercrime report and Wasabi Wallet? Uh, mm -hmm. What does it mean for the end user? And uh, did you also like look into Samurai or did you just look into Wasabi? Yeah, so my uh, my new newsletter called This Month in Bitcoin Privacy is basically just me taking what the things that I'm already paying attention to and kind of have already been taking notes on and just putting it out there in the public because I just noticed that there was a lot of interest in these topics, but I didn't see anyone writing about it on a consistent basis. I mean, there are a lot of people on Twitter, obviously, especially talking about um, privacy tools and improving privacy tools. There's a lot of great people working on them, um, but there just wasn't like a a particular writer or newsletter that I found that was covering these topics um, consistently. So I thought, well, I can do that because that's something that I already do in private. So that's what the newsletter is. It's basically um, a summary of events uh, and conversations that have happened over the previous month. So for June, it was everything that happened or that I noticed happening in June. And that includes um, technology developments, events, conversations that um, have to do with Bitcoin privacy. And that doesn't necessarily have to be, um, that doesn't necessarily have to be stuff that directly affects Bitcoin or has to do with Bitcoin transactions. It could be, you know, an exchange has a data breach. Um, that has to do with Bitcoin privacy because that information can be used to target people. Um, so that's why I started it. Uh, in terms of my focus, um, I mean, the, the Wasabi does come up a lot in this newsletter just because um, Wasabi is something that has recently caught the attention of various uh, government agencies. Um, and also just because uh, Nopara was a co-host with me on a podcast that I do. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, I'm, I'm, I've interacted with him a lot more than with Samurai, but I do make a mention of Samurai several times also in the newsletter. Um, one of them was that 
they have uh, recently, or, well, actually, it was the anniversary uh, last month of them uh, releasing their Dojo software, which is basically a specialized uh, node software um, device that um, that can that users can either buy from one of their distributors or build themselves um, and connect to their Samurai wallet uh, on their mobile device. Yeah, great which product. Is great. Yeah. Yeah, which is great because and in this in this particular instance, the one that I featured was, was Ronin Dojo because they actually built on top of the Dojo back end and kind of played around with the user interface, and I thought that was cool. Um, there was another instance where um, someone who goes by Damn Cool on Twitter uh, wrote a guide about how to actually run uh, Lightning stuff on your Dojo node, which is cool because that that kind of improves the uh, offering of these various node devices that you can say, hey, you don't have to just do Lightning channel management. You don't just have to do coin join stuff. You can do both at the same time, um, which is really great because that makes it a lot easier for people to not only use all of the tools available to them that could be enhancing their privacy, but it also just makes the devices more useful and so more people would be willing to get them and become more sovereign, uh, financially sovereign, uh, which nodes help with that. Yeah, I have so many questions, but uh, as we go along, uh, but uh, one thing that I'm really curious is about your, um, is that like a, a special um, like section you did, uh, you did about revision control journalism? Can you talk about that? I'm really curious about. Yeah, um, so I've been working um, on this, well, initially I started off working on a model that I've since called revision control journalism back in 2016 when I started an investigation um, into a you know particularly dramatic uh, and uh, talked about story and um, I don't remember the original reason why I particularly chose to do it on GitHub. I think it was just because I I, I wanted there to be a place uh, where as I was investigating the story, I didn't have to worry about, hey, I've made another update, have, like reminding people that it's been updated or something like that. And I also wanted the edits to be transparent, which is something that you can't really do with a lot of blogging platforms that most people use, like WordPress. And so I was like, I'm just going to do it on GitHub. And as I was doing that, then I was thinking about, like, well, if people are going to ask me why using GitHub, I should probably have an explanation, like, what what is the what is the value add of doing it on GitHub versus WordPress? And so the the stuff that I was doing in blog posts, like normal blog posts that I was writing already was um, was a form of open source intelligence because when I was writing, I would try as much as possible to provide links to my sources so that if someone, um, even if you know they, they trusted me, um, that I was representing the material faithfully, um, they might just be interested in where I got my information from, so I always wanted to provide that. Um, but I think bro more broadly, um, in the field of journalism, I think that online journalism has a terrible, has some very terrible habits when it comes to linking, not only not linking enough, but in terms of what they link to and uh, things like that. Um, I read a piece recently which was kind of grading various um, articles on their linking practices. For example, something you see very often is that you'll have an article and they'll make a statement and they won't link directly to the source. They'll link to, for example, a previous article where mm -hmm. they where they wrote about something like that, even if it's not as good as the original source material. They'll yeah, link that, to their own article. That's so called like ter secondary and tertiary sources. Like you shouldn't also do that. I think when you write a PhD or something like that or dissertation, it's better. You know, yeah. it's actually it's actually this is how the way it should be. That's why I, I love you know where you write source verification consideration is one of the primary mechanisms through which fake news is identified. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's um, because this whole model, when I was trying to think of like, what is the origin of it? Has anyone else done this? Um, I found obviously Julian Assange's scientific journalism, where he basically talked about the need for journalism to more closely align itself with the practices and principles that people writing academic papers at the very least, or writing scientific, like writing up scientific studies 
do, which is you you can't you can link to yourself, but if that's not the best uh, if that's not the best thing that you can provide, you should obviously go to the primary sources first. You should provide the data the the primary source data first, um, which a lot of journalists don't do. There was even an instance where. Uh, uh, on the grading piece that I mentioned, um, they called someone out for, uh, they didn't even link to a source, they just linked to a tag on their own website. So like, here's other stories about this specific topic, but it's not a source. Um, and the problem with all these practices is that, unfortunately, we've come to associate, um, as as readers of journalistic material, we've come to associate this, this magical blue hyperlink uh, text as, um, some kind of like authoritative stamp, like, oh, it's linked. That means that there's something to back this up. It's probably true, <laughs> which is, it's very, very thin ice to skate on to right. assume that because if you, if you actually go through and check the kinds of like, just find, find a, an article that you actually agree with or find an article that you disagree with and check what kinds of links they add to their story. And then you should consider, you know, how much trust you're putting into them in terms of like, have they actually published any original documents that look authentic? Um, or are they just kind of just linking to random sources, maybe their friends um, and all of that. There's this whole term called the link economy, which I find pretty hilarious because economy kind of implies that there's like some kind of monetary incentive behind <laughs> linking instead of like, is this a good source? Is this true? Um, so that's something I'm going to be kind of criticizing and evaluating in the next document that I produce on this because um, I'm still working on it. I'm, I'm iterating on, on my own model and uh, how I explain it to people. So that's something I'm going to be looking at as well. All right. Very fantastic. Did you before um, um, it's your floor now, uh, Stephanie, but uh, did you get, get like any kind of feedback from, you know, other readers or, or followers of you or, or, you know, people who, who might rely on these kind of, 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 of sources information, like any kind of you know, feedback? Yeah, um, I, I've gotten a lot of feedback from readers. Um, I mean, not as much as I'd like, because uh, you know, I did my investigation on GitHub, and GitHub provides very limited analytics, which I'm not. I'm not against that because I don't really, in general, agree on surveilling readers as a way to, you know, make money or anything. Um, but GitHub is very limited analytics, and so I can see relatively like how many people have been reading my my piece um, over time. And so I've, I've definitely had a lot of readers. I've gotten some feedback and it's generally been pretty positive. Like people like the fact, even on pieces where I'm, I'm not actually trying to practice this model and linking to as many sources as possible, people like the fact that I'm actually linking to sources, which is like, even when I do it very little, that kind of makes me feel sad because that means that they're used to people not even linking at all. Uh, when when it's necessary, sometimes it's not. Like if you're producing a, if you are producing a piece that you are the primary source and you're providing documents, then you ne you don't necessarily have to link to one. But if you're relying on on third party statements and information, then you should be doing that. Um, so I've gotten that feedback, um, and then I've ac I've actually gotten feedback from people that have been mentioned or included in my investigations, and um, and th they find the document valuable just because I was thorough enough to, you know, link to so many sources and kind of put put the story in a broader context and not just focus on a particular event or a particular statement, but to show like, okay, what happened before this? What happened after this? What are the motivations? What other people are involved? And they found out things about themselves through that that they didn't know before. So. Um, that's the kind of feedback I've gotten so far. Excellent. All right, Stephanie, um, let's talk about privacy or whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, sure. So um, maybe for those that didn't dig that deep yet into privacy yet, um, it could be interesting to know, yeah, why privacy matters. I mean, many come, um, yeah, I don't have anything to hide. Why is it important for me? So when there's a whistleblower, of course, uh, we know that it is relevant. But why is privacy relevant for the individual? 
Yeah, so um, I think the, the best way for me to frame this is to say that, um, especially lately, I've been using the term informational self-determination um, because uh, we're accustomed to hearing the term self-determination in a political context, not only for an individual um, saying that a person should have the free choice over their own body and actions without um, external compulsion, but also uh, in the context of a group's rights, like a, uh, a culture or a, group, a larger group of people, um, that they should have the right to choose their sovereignty and political status, um, hence the phrase uh, consent of the governed that's related to this. And so informational self-determination is therefore the choice over how how and when information about you is communicated and used by others. And the reason I like this term better is because it's more clear, um, it more clearly communicates um, what people should, but perhaps don't understand about the importance of privacy, which is that privacy is not just about secrets. It is not just about hiding things. It's about the power to selectively reveal oneself to the world, which is actually a quote from Eric Hughes. Um, he wrote that in the Cypherpunk Manifesto uh, from 1993. And so I think that's an important distinction that when people say, you know, you have nothing to hide, that's the most, com or do you have something to hide? That's the most common question when you hear, uh, when you bring up privacy. And the response I would have is, well, uh, <laughs> I, would, I would almost compare it to, um, to, to sex, actually. Um, assuming privacy is about hiding something is kind of like assuming that that sex is about, um, ab or consent in sex is about abstinence, um, about just completely refraining from it at all. But actually the case that's about choosing who you want to be with and how you want to act with them, that's what privacy should be about. And you should have the ability and the right to withhold certain information if especially you are in a situation where revealing that information would put you at risk. I think that's a very um, I think that's a very practical way of looking at it for people that don't have you know an ideological justification for it. Um, and so and actually informational self-determination is the term that is used in the German Constitution in place of privacy which is more of a US uh, North American centric uh, way of looking at it. And this is also something that Sarah Jamie Lewis, who's the uh, executive director of Open Privacy emphasizes, where she says that um, privacy is the right to consent, privacy is the right to withdraw consent, to only provide information to people you want to provide it to when you want to provide it. Um, and then kind of related to that statement, she also says the modern debate about privacy has been focused on its contention with security um, framed around terrorism and criminality. And what was lost in this debate was uh, uh, the very real day-to-day -day battles that we all face when we lose privacy. Yeah, amazing. Thank you very much. That was uh, really onto the point. Um, but I can also go into kind of, um, because I think an important paper on this about kind of the, the the conflating or the conflicting narratives that we hear about um, privacy and security, and especially the people who who will repeat that phrase about, um, well, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to lose. There is a great paper by uh, Philip Rogaway called The Moral Character of Cryptographic Work, which um, I think is based on a speech. It's like he, he made a speech and then he published a paper in 2015. Um, and uh, he talks about what I um, talked about with the cypherpunks and what they believe, which is that cryptography is about um, is about power. Um, and that's something that Julian Assange also mentioned in the book Cypherpunks that inspired me, um, where he said that the universe believes in encryption. It's easier to encrypt information than it is to decrypt it. And cryptography is the ultimate form of nonviolent direct action because no amount of coercive force will ever solve a math problem. Um, so that's that's kind of the the background. I don't know if he cited Assange in that, but it's a very similar argument that he makes. And what he highlights in the paper is that there's these two competing narratives about privacy and how valuable it is. Because on the one hand, law enforcement and regulators present 
privacy as yes, it can be a personal good, but it's in conflict with the so-called collective good of, of security, often national security. And they claim that if we have too much privacy, too much of this personal good, there will be a, they call it a going dark problem where they are unable to solve crimes because there's, there's just too much privacy. And so Rogueway kind of counters that point um, by showing the other narrative, which is yes, privacy is a personal good, but it is also a collective good because privacy can enhance security. Um, because you know we've seen with law enforcement and lately blockchain surveillance companies in the context of Bitcoin, uh, they are always focusing on the positive effects of the apps, uh, the absence of encryption, and the the positive effects of breaking people's privacy or not providing them with enough and forcing them to disclose information that they don't necessarily need. Um, they never talk about the the massive societal harm that is caused by lack of privacy. They don't talk about women and children who are stalked through malicious smartphone applications that broadcast your location and turn on your camera without you being aware of it, which is something that a company like Neutrino is very familiar with because they produce software um, and they are within an industry that produced software that ostensibly was being used to catch criminals, but was being repurposed by others um, relatively easily to uh, target innocent people who are who have committed no crime and are in fact using it to to act in a criminal way themselves. Um, they also don't talk about the data breaches of sensitive personal information that occur when um, when malicious actors take advantage of the fact that companies force people to turn over personal uh, identifying information just to be allowed to use their service because the government uh, and a lot of times the government says that they have to um, and then they don't talk about for example uh, there was a story recently about um, an african-american man who was wrongfully arrested because a very dumb facial recognition ai was looking for a criminal who kind of looked like him but didn't actually match his face properly um, because a lot of uh, facial recognition software hasn't been trained on people with darker faces, which can be a blessing and a curse because it means they can't recognize you, but it also means you can get, uh, you can get caught up with another person who has a, a similar racial profile as you, but is obviously not you. Um, and so the number of people that are put at risk by, by mass surveillance and know your customer policies and other law enforcement policies is actually far, far greater than the people who might at some point become a victim of uh, the kinds of attacks that law, enforc law enforcement says they're trying to prevent. Um, there's also an interesting discussion to be had, especially in relation to the uh, global situation with lockdowns and such. Um, because we've, you've probably noticed that a lot of these attacks that are supposed to be prevented by these practices of mass surveillance and stuff, they keep happening anyway. Uh, and so there was the question of why did, why did the Chinese mass surveillance not, why was it not able to stop um, the virus from, from becoming a huge issue in China? Why was the US and other intelligence agencies in the West not able to prevent the spread of the virus to the West. Um, clearly they have failed. And the reason they failed is because they've built up a system where they are, they are sucking in so much information that they have no idea what to do with it. Um, at some point, maybe they'll be able to do something with it. But when it actually matters, when people's lives could potentially possibly be um, saved by these kinds of practices, which is very limited, um, they end up failing because they're, they're not even using them in a way that benefits people's safety. So yeah. there's a total overflow of information and they don't even know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> no, that's good, but it's so there's an overflow of information, right? So they don't even know how to process all this information because it's just, it's just overwhelming or, or, or it's just too compartmentalized everything. I mean, is that, on, is that on top of that, the compartmentalization of all these, whatever intelligence and, and, and institutions and... <clears throat> yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they, because there's one aspect, there's the collection, and then the other aspect is being able to, they use the term structure, so they have to be able to structure it into a way that actually 
a human can come and make decisions, or even a computer, um, an advanced computer, um, has to be able to make decisions about that information. But if it's not structured in a way that can be analyzed, then you've, you basically just surveil the entire world and have this information that you're not able to do anything with until basically you get enough information to know what to look for, which can often be too late. Um, and it was particularly interesting recently, someone uh, from Coinbase, a former Coinbase person, uh, which you'll be able to find, I don't really need to mention him here, but a former Coinbase executive uh, made statements at a, a cryptocurrency conference saying that um, we should use the NSA mass surveillance data for COVID-19 uh, contact tracing. And I just thought that was really interesting because on the one hand he was saying like, he, he was basically justifying these surveillance programs and saying that they're useful, which is debatable. But then on the other hand, he was saying like, well, we should use this. And the question I have is, well, why hasn't, been, why hasn't it been used yet? How did we even arrive at this situation <laughs> if those strategies are useful in the first place? Yeah, so I had, uh, I was reading a really interesting article on AML and if the AML laws really like pro prohibited um, money laundering, uh, prevented it, I, I meant, and there was like hardly any change into the money laundering, maybe like from 0.5% to 1% or something, that yeah. it's just nothing. And so in my opinion, um, I rather think it's kind of a cover story to justify mass surveillance and also to use the data la later economically and mine them and um, yeah. Yeah, and of course in, in that kind of situation where, you know, you, you know, they claim that they prevented money laundering and you may say, okay, well they did a little bit, so that's good enough, but what they, what they don't talk about is how many people have been excluded from the financial system, how many people have been kicked out who may have had access before and now don't because of those policies um, that have maybe just caught them unfairly. Uh, because there's so many people that don't even have the right identity documents to provide to these services that require them. And so a lot of people are kept out of at least the traditional financial system. And in some cases now with the rise of like crypto banks, um, they're being kept out of this so-called op new open financial system that is supposedly better um, by companies who are not actually building an open financial system. They're copying the old model and saying, look, we have, we have crypto tokens, Co come and get them, um, which is not very attractive to me because the whole reason that I became interested in this stuff is for censorship resistance and and control of um, of your you know your financial power and giving it over to these companies that um, in effect actually exclude more people uh, in many ways than the traditional financial system does is just kind of weird to me. Yeah, entirely. Um, I just sent you, Kevin, into the chat the link to uh, this article. The war on money laundering has failed. Can we fix it? It's it's really interesting to get also some some data. Yeah, I'm gonna put it in the show notes. I haven't read it yet. Wow, cool. Um, so, um, Janine, so where do you see Bitcoin going? I mean, isn't it? Isn't that exactly all these reasons? I mean, first of all, I think we should sometimes once once in a while make ourselves aware and or, or make people conscious of the fact that, I mean, it's such a farce, you know, this whole, I don't even understand the purpose of all these legislations when, when considering, you know, when, when understanding how many, you know, billions or trillions of, of fiat money has been laundered. I think we've got to repeat this once in a while, you know, through the banking system, central banking system, financial institutions, money laundered. Uh, what's your position on that? I mean, uh, this is, is that like a, is that a schizophrenic uh, state of mind or? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was actually something um, in the first story that I covered in my newsletter, um, which was a basically a debate between Alex Gladstein and Tom Robinson, who is the co-founder of Elliptic, one of the blockchain surveillance companies. Um, he, he was talking about those kind, well, no, he wasn't talking about it. Um, and actually, I don't think anyone in the debate brought it up, but I, I criticized the fact that, you know, Tom and a lot of these other companies, they claim to be, you know, 
uh, that they're they're trying to take down large criminal enterprises or so I think that was a term that was used um, that they're trying to combat them and my response to that um, was actually the the financial surveillance that you're conducting is more likely going to hurt uh, like small people people who don't have a lot of wealth than it is the uber wealthy who are actually using the state and these uh, these financial systems to their own benefit and often hiding their own criminality and basically that's what blockchain surveillance and and tying yourself to the traditional financial system is supporting you're supporting a criminal enterprise where governments launder money for each other banks launder money to each other and they're all getting away with it and it's no no one's ever going to go to jail for that because they run the system um, but they're going to punish the small people who, you know, maybe bought, bought some drugs for a couple hundred dollars um, because that effect is so much greater, uh, apparently, and so much more concerning. But they're never going to catch the people who are actually committing the vast majority of crime and, and influencing people's lives in a negative way. Yeah, thanks for expressing that. Finally, it's, uh, you know, it's time to say that because... Uh, it's always, you know, giving a front in order to, you know, to to justify whatever the ends or the means of whatever, you know. So yeah. Um, so Stephanie, uh, did you want to like go a little bit deeper into privacy, or into the slides um, of of Stephanie? Yeah, yeah, sure. So you were already mentioning the blockchain surveillance companies, and what I found in your slides is that the clients of these are actually intelligent agencies. So uh, that was this was really fascinating. Maybe you can um, elaborate a little bit more on that. Yeah, I don't particularly remember. I think towards I think you're referring to the part at the end where um, I point out that a lot of these companies are the like a lot of their clients are, for example, the IRS or even, like you said, intelligence agencies. Um, and to me, I mean, I, I found that easily. That was actually open public information that I just found. Um, it wasn't a secret. I didn't, I mean, you probably could find some of that depending on the contractual relationship. You probably could find out more about that just by doing a freedom of information request. Um, but yeah, to me, that wasn't surprising because um, if you think about it, the nature of blockchain surveillance and just a lot of analysis companies, especially from Silicon Valley in general, that have been popping up over the last 20 years, um, they're very similar to basically, uh, uh, I, I will even use the word non-state intelligence service, which is the term that actually Mike Pompeo used to describe WikiLeaks, which I think is incorrect um, because they're, they're, they're a publisher. They're, they're, they're not actually conducting the, um, they're not actually sourcing a lot of the documents and materials themselves. They're getting it from whistleblowers, but um, in a way, a lot of these companies are kind of non-state intelligence agencies because um, it, for anyone who's not familiar, there's this uh, arrangement called the five eyes, which is basically, and well, there's the five eyes and then the 14 eyes, but that's, uh, that's another discussion. Um, but the five eyes is basically this collaboration between um, a bunch of nation states, uh, including the United States. And uh, I can't remember who exactly is on the five eyes list, but I think it's like New Zealand, the G GCU, uh, the, what is it called? GCHQ, something like with headquarters or something in, is in Great Britain or UK? Uh, yeah, yeah, something probably. Like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember the exact list off the top of my head, but basically like major, major countries, mostly Western countries are, are on that list. And basically they have this agreement that like, hey, you know, we have all of these unfortunate constitutional protections for our citizens that say that we're, we're not allowed to surveil them as much as we like, but you as a foreign government, well, maybe you're not allowed to surveil them, but you can get away with it um, much more than we can. So you surveil our citizens and then share that data with us somehow, or at least the results maybe of that surveillance. And then we'll surveil your citizens and we'll provide you with, uh, with that information. So they're kind of routing around uh, oh, Fourth Amendment-esque, at least in the United States, the, it would be the Fourth Amendment, but they're kind of routing around um, constitutional, legal, and other legal protections that citizens have um, to surveil them by having this agreement with other countries. And, and blockchain surveillance companies and 
more broadly analysis companies, um, including like ad tech type stuff, um, they kind of operate in a similar way, which is that they are collecting a ton, in many ways, more information um, than than these uh, intelligence agencies do on a on a personal like targeted specific basis to you. They are collecting often more information, personal information, identifying information about you than than these agencies are. And they're just doing it um, a lot of the times for marketing purposes. They're using it to target you with ads about, you know, what products you should buy and stuff. And um, this is why I think like, you know, I think ad blocking and ad blocking tools, they're not only important in terms of like, um, you know, I don't want to see this annoying ad or whatever, or I don't want to be tracked by this ad tech company around the web. Um, in some ways, they're, they're a protest against surveillance in general because these analysis companies, a lot of the time, they have contracts with, with other companies that don't use that data for marketing purposes. They use it for law enforcement purposes. Um, and so the government will then contract uh, with those companies, often not directly because they don't want to reveal the relationship, but they will contract with those companies in order to get access to that information. And the reason that's important is because at least in the US um, and in a lot of cases in other countries, that allows them to get around the Fourth Amendment requirement, which is that they should have a, a warrant that is backed up by probable cause. Um, but then there's this thing called the third party uh, doctrine, uh, which um, has been used in a number of cases in the US to basically say that if you provide your information to a third party, you no longer have Fourth Amendment protection. Um, and this is a case that I'm going to be, or one particular case that I'm going to be mentioning in my next newsletter, which is um, there was recently an appeal in the United States District Court for, um, I think it was the Western District of Texas, where the court, um, it was like a circuit of judges who countered a defendant's argument that he had a reasonable expectation of privacy for his Bitcoin transactions. And he cited a case called Carpenter versus US, um, which was a case from 2018, where the Supreme Court found that actually the government does need a warrant based on probable cause to access a person's cell phone location history, which is one of those things that companies do like private companies, even just for marketing purposes, that is something that they collect information about and may end up sharing with law enforcement. And law enforcement has been getting around this requirement for a warrant by saying, well, you gave your cell phone location history to this third party, therefore you don't have Fourth Amendment protection. Um, and so Carpenter was a very important case because it says, well, actually, no, there are some circumstances where if you're not even aware that this information is being collected by a third party if you're not knowingly sharing it and if that information that you're sharing gives a very detailed history of your personal life like it's it's particularly invasive then that can be a problem and that should probably uh require an actual warrant to get and use that information in a court of law um so that was a big deal because um that kind of counters a uh, prevailing law enforcement practice. Um, however, in this particular case in Texas, um, they said that under the third party doctrine, the Supreme Court in um, another case called uh, Miller versus United States held that bank records are not subject to the Fourth Amendment protections. I, I can't remember what year that case is from, but it's, relatively, um, it's a relatively well-known case. And so they decided bank records are not are not given that protection. They're still falling within this third party doctrine. And um, because the defendant in this other case out of Texas was using Coinbase, uh, at least partially um, a third party service, his Coinbase, Coinbase records are not considered um, or were con his Coinbase records were considered akin to bank records. And so then they combine that in combination with the public record um, that is on the Bitcoin blockchain of transactions. They basically, these judges concluded that the defendant could, could not really have a privacy interest. He did not have a substantial um, right to privacy in that case, which is really important just in general for people to know that you know bank records are still excluded from Fourth Amendment protections and by proxy, 
any uh, services that you use, especially exchanges, um, they are going to fall under the same umbrella a lot of the time. And that's important for people to know because, um, you know, data breaches keep happening um, and other non-consensual disclosures of financial history related to cryptocurrencies that can put people at risk. And so third parties are not only security holes, but they're also privacy holes. Um, and so we need to be very aware and very careful of who we're providing this personally identifying information to because they could not only mishandle it, but that record um, could easily be available to law enforcement in ways that people were not anticipating. Do you see more um, lawsuits or class action lawsuits um, in regard to these the questions coming up, like when it comes to privacy or you know, civil rights, uh, whatever, you know, maybe institutions or, or groups coming together and trying, you know, to make a, a precedent in order to you know, protect uh, the privacy of the individuals? Yeah. Um, I would hope so. The problem is that, um, like for Coinbase in particular, I'm very familiar with them because of the whole uh, Neutrino hacking team debacle that was exposed last year. Um, <clears throat> but the problem is with a lot of these companies, we don't actually know very much about how they are using um, this information about you. We don't know how they are tying it into whatever blockchain surveillance software they are either partnered with or potentially uh, creating themselves. In the case of Coinbase, they they acquired uh, Neutrino, which uh, was founded by former hacking team Upper Management, and then they have since rebranded it to Coinbase Analytics, uh, and that was a very uh, that was a public thing that they did because uh, there's this whole potential contract that they are exploring with the IRS. And it was mentioned in that uh, request that uh, Coinbase Analytics is formally known as Neutrino. Um, so they're basically building their own blockchain surveillance software and running it. And it's not very clear. Um, I mean, they claim that no, no customer personal information is being used in that, but that's kind of a hard claim to make because <laughs> Um, that means you're somehow deliberately excluding the financial information of your own customers from your blockchain surveillance. I highly doubt that. Um, I, I don't think that's happening. And that would also kind of, you know, considering Coinbase has so many customers that would neutralize the effectiveness of it and probably not as many, uh, not as many clients would be interested in using it if that was the case. So, um, yeah, it's, it's hard to tell because we don't know how exactly they're using it. And uh, the problem with class action lawsuits is that in a class action lawsuit, you have to demonstrate that a large group of people, um, that a large group of people had uh, suffered the consequences of some, you know, whether it was uh, uh, some lapse in due diligence or some other harm that was caused to them. You have to demonstrate that a large amount of people suffered that. Yeah. And in a lot of in a lot of cases, like um, where where the lack of privacy is taken advantage of, um, that's usually on an individual basis. Mm -hmm. um, in, in terms of like what is what information is publicly available and uh, the con and the actual consequences, and um, it's hard to you know go out and say, hey, you know, were were you affected by this uh, with by the same policy change that I was. Um, so class, class action lawsuits in that case are very hard because a lot of this, uh, even though it's mass surveillance, they will target people on an individual basis when it suits them. And so it's hard to do those kinds of uh, counter attacks. Yeah. So the best remedy, again, coming back a little bit uh, to Bitcoin specifically, is that what would you suggest, um, uh, Janine? I mean, at the end of the day, um, we got to take individual action. I mean, there is like, you know, exponential pace of development now, you know, in the, uh, uh, when it comes to privacy tools or, or even, you know, for the average user now, the, the UX is being improved. Uh, uh, things are becoming more easier. Do you, I mean, would you say that it's really overdue that more and more people start using, um, you know, start using CoinJoin or, you know, start to, taint every coin there is what, what's what's the remedy here i mean <clears throat> um i think i mean i i definitely agree that like things like coin join and the upcoming uh coin swap and um also improvements possible improvements to lightning with like zk channels which is using 
Um, zero knowledge proofs, which you may have heard of because uh, Zcash uses them, um, though they are actually, they're not the only ones to use them. Uh, Greg Maxwell actually did a uh, transaction many years ago before Zcash launched using uh, a type of zero knowledge proof. And um, yeah, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of like very technical and complicated, uh, well, complicated to the average person, um, improvements to Bitcoin privacy that are coming up. Um, and I definitely encourage people to learn about those, uh, learn about how they work and to use any, at least try out any tools that are available that offer those kinds of things. Um, but as I show in my, my, uh, my Bitcoin privacy presentation I gave last year, there's a lot of practices um, and behaviors that you can be doing without using specialized tools that can be enormously helpful to maintaining your financial privacy um, besides just using particular wallets um, and using particular tools in those wallets. And the biggest one, which Jameson Lopp in particular brings up very often in terms of uh, his posts that he titled uh, a modest uh, privacy proposal or something like that. Um, the, the primary problem for a lot of people is that they're, they're just too willing to give up personal information to third party services. And that is one of the biggest problems. Um, at the end of the day, you could be, you could be using all of these tools. You could be using CoinJoin. You could be using, um, some of the tools, uh, really interesting ones that Samurai Wallet offers, um, in addition to CoinJoin that they've had recently with their their world pool um, service. You could be using all of them, but then if you're then going to Coinbase and selling all of your your coins um, or even just holding them there, and I mean, Coinbase wouldn't allow you to do this probably if you were you were uh, basically withdrawing from Coinbase and then coin joining and then putting it back in Coinbase. Um, that uh, if they even allow you to do that, that's a terrible way to, uh, that, that's a terrible way to handle your coin privacy because you're not only providing a lot of personal information to Coinbase, but you're saying to Coinbase, these are my coins. And so they can, from that basis, look back in the history and say, okay, well, this is how much coins this person has. If they haven't been spending them or they haven't got more of them, we can relatively you know, estimate. Uh, if, I mean, if you bought them from Coinbase, then that that's also defeating the purpose of the privacy tools. Um, so it has to do a lot with which third-party services you choose to use and what those third-party services do with the information you give them. Um, for example, there was uh, uh, like the recent announcement of the the Strike app um, that Jack Mahler's created. Um, some people are concerned about the fact that Yes, um, in order to initially open the wallet, you only have to provide a name and phone number, but then they're connected to a third party service called Cognito, which uses that information to potentially get more information about you because phones suck. And when, when you, a lot of people, when they register a phone, they give tons of information for that. And that information is a lot of times made available to various data brokers and stuff. And uh, that's part of the whole, uh, location tracking uh, service that law enforcement plugs into in a lot of cases, maybe even the one that went to the Supreme Court um, that ended up challenging that practice a bit. Um, so you you have to be aware of like not only the wallets you're using, but what kinds of partnerships they have with um, with other companies and what they may be using your information to do um, in ways that you may not even be aware of. Like a lot of people don't think that that disclosing their phone number is a huge, can be a huge um, privacy leak um, because they're not aware of how mobile phone networks work. They're not aware of how your, your phone number is often linked to your identity in ways that you're not aware of. And so that's an important thing to keep in mind when you're using services, especially if they connect, if they're connecting to any kind of bank account, there are going to be extra checks involved there. And so, I definitely recommend any service that you're using, especially if you're providing personal information, you should always be reading the privacy policy because it may surprise you what they're doing in the background. So, yeah, I mean, this is this is always a question I'm asking, how does the average person, you know, out there to, you know, to, to understand, you know, to make all this due diligence before even, you know, clicking on, you know, I agree or consent. 
um, you know, for the sake of it, just to buy you know, sort of a, a K, non KYCs, more or less peer to peer. I, you know, I got on BISC exchange and I finally did it after a lot of glitches and, and whatever it was, bugs or encountering, you know, really um, uh, uncomfortable experiences. But at the end of the day, I, I did it and, and I bought, you know, just a very small fraction of a Bitcoin. And, uh, but still, it, um, is, would you think, I mean, I don't know, according to your knowledge, is that possible to still do some tracking if, even if you just do sort of the peer-to-peer -peer wire transfer? Because that's, that's how it works, right? You, you find someone, uh, you pick the, whatever, you select the, the, the payment procedure in that, in that case, what's SEPA, and then I do wire transfer it, you know? Um, do you know anything, like anything about that? Is that like a risk or? Um, I mean, you're you, in those in those cases. You're still, I mean, you're using the traditional financial system, and so the amount that they'll know about you and what you're doing will be similar to, you know, if if you if you just if there's no Bitcoin involved and you're just sending a payment to another person for whatever reason, obviously they're aware of that, um, and so obviously that that is still a concern that possibly. You know, someone who's surveilling you can then see, okay, there's this movement with their bank account and such. But um, at the end of the day, for the vast majority of people who are going to use it, um, the only thing that most people are going to see is like, hey, this 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 transaction occurred between these two bank accounts. Um, that's relatively normal. People people do that for a variety of reasons. It's not inherently suspicious, um, especially if it's below a certain amount. And the BISC stuff, um, I mean, uh, as far as I know, um, I mean, it's, it's a decentralized network. And so the information that you're disclosing would only be limited to that other person that you're trading with. Um, so that, that might be a concern for some people, um, but it's far, far less of a risk than going to you know a big institution or service like Coinbase where you don't actually know who in that company is getting access to your information. You don't know what kind of analysis they're performing on it in the background. You don't know um, all these kinds of things. And so it's a lot less clear about what kinds of information is going to who. Um, it, like it's it's just a whole different scale. So yes, there is, there is always some concern even with BISC when you're, we're, when you're plugging into the traditional financial, financial system in any way, there are going to be there are going to be privacy leaks there, but not nearly as egregious as with with other systems. And especially, you know, if you're if you're buying Bitcoin with cash, that's that's even better. That's what I usually recommend, because again, the only person then who knows that potentially knows, you know, you could wear a mask or whatever. The only person who potentially knows that you did this transaction is the person that you traded with. Um, and so that's that's very privacy friendly, and it's also. Um, I mean, it, it's 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 also the way that Bitcoin was intended to be used, which is peer to peer, directly to another person. Um, so that's the best way to do it. And I think that's also, in many ways, the for people that aren't familiar technically with how Bitcoin works, it can be one of the most user friendly ways because one of the one of the methods for getting your first Bitcoin is often just showing up to a, a meetup or some kind of gathering and being like, hey. Um, you know, I'm I'm interested in getting some Bitcoin. Can can someone sell me some or give me some or whatever? And um, so you'll you'll literally in a lot of cases have a person right there telling you, you know, what wallet is probably best to use and here's what all this terminology means. So they can be right there to help you with things that you don't understand, which is not something that you usually get uh, when you're when you're signing up with an exchange, they'll just tell you to go through this series of steps, and you don't know why, and you can't really dispute why you have to go through those steps. Um, and sometimes you'll get customer support, but uh, you know this industry does not have a great reputation for customer support. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Jenny, let me go back to Jack Malice because I mean I'm a huge fan. Of Jack Malice is is you know he's just a genius, this guy, and the way you know he explains things, he simplifies this. He's a master of simplification and UX, and he understands the desires, the true, true needs, desires, and wishes of the average person out there. So, and that's also you know been my hope because I know he's got a big heart for the cannabis dispensaries or whatever in, in the United States. And I don't know, I'm not sure whether his mom got his got a cannabis dispensary or his family, but um, so that would be also. I thought that would be a good, a really you know awesome 
option for people like for merchants to give their clients or customers here's an app download it it's easy you don't pay any fees and um but then again you know i was like really what do i know you know about privacy because usually these people in grow shops or cannabis dispensaries they want to pay cash they want to do it anonymously so it would that be the equivalent paying with lightning uh, with the with the strike app uh, that you know that was my first question i mean how, how you know what do i know yeah, so I haven't I haven't really looked into all of the use cases for Strike um, because with the announcement, um, basically in order to just open the app, it is true that you only need to provide a name and phone number. And I think it's possible that there are certain use cases for the app where you don't like you don't have to connect a bank account, you don't have to provide any additional information, especially below a certain threshold. Um, if you're just doing very small lightning payments, um, that would make sense to me. I think when you get to the point where you know anyone, including Jack, would have trouble implementing this in a in a optimal privacy respecting way is when you connect a bank account and when you're dealing with large sums of money and he's obviously providing a service where you know he's going to be exchanging fiat for Bitcoin in order for this thing to work or vice versa. And so that is always going to involve some form of KYC for those use cases because that's what the traditional financial system demands. Um, what I did appreciate about what Jack did though is um, he includes this story about how, you know, he was told by, he calls it the suit man lawyer, lawyer guy <laughs> yeah. um, in general. And he tells a story about the suit man lawyer guy who was telling him that basically any user who opens this app has to provide their name, their address, their date of birth, some form of ID, a photo ID, um, all, all this information just for opening the app. And it sounds like he fought against that, which regardless of whether he was ultimately successful in in providing as much privacy as like someone like me would prefer in the service, I do appreciate whenever I hear that any uh, service provider makes an effort to combat this prevailing narrative that we should just collect it all or you have to collect it all because that is something that these uh, blockchain surveillance companies are promoting um, often without any legal basis whatsoever because it, it they are financially incentivized to convince people that their services are necessary and without them you can't operate legally which in a lot of cases is not actually true and it's very insidious because um, what will end up happening is even if even if the laws currently are a lot better in terms of what you actually are required to do um, to be compliant, those uh, those compliance requirements that are being set by the blockchain surveillance companies are eventually going to actually creep into the law and make it make it that hard for these companies to operate without basically doxing all of their users, which is unfortunate and why I hate that. Um, so I do appreciate. Um, that Jack at least made an effort um, to do that. But again, every service you use, any form of KYC they're doing, or or even without KYC, you should be checking whether their claims are actually valid and whether they're doing what they say they're doing. Um, because, uh, I mean, it might actually be worthwhile for someone to, to set up a service that says, um, hey, this wallet claims to do this in terms of protecting your privacy, but actually they have all these partnerships with these companies and here's what they do. Um, I would be interested in participating in something like that to uh, run as a service because I think a lot of people need it. Um, but yeah, so. Awesome. Janine, let's wrap it up. Um, what do you, uh, do you want to like direct, uh, uh, Stephanie, did you, have, did you have any other final thoughts or questions for Janine? Well, uh, one more thing actually. So um, what I didn't know until recently is that you do need to have a full node to have full privacy, but I mean, it's actually like quite straightforward because otherwise you're using a third party server, um, but I just wanted to like shout this out. Um, yeah. So, but apart from that, uh, everything is answered. Thank you so much, Janine. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, there's actually a story in my newsletter about um, a core developer. Um, her name is Amidi, and she's actually working on improving. Um, she's improving node privacy by uh, looking at how uh, how nodes um, actually broadcast transactions to each other in Bitcoin's peer-to-peer -peer network, and how that can potentially be a privacy leak because. Um, obviously, when your node is 
telling the network, hey, here's my transaction, please uh, try to forward it to eventually a miner who will include it in the block. Um, that can be revealing about whether you're the source node for that transaction. Um, and she provides a very like uh, a very watered down kind of description of this scenario and how it works. So even if you're not technical, you should be able to understand it. Um, and then there's some technical stuff as well about how she how she's been proposing to fix that. So yeah, I definitely recommend looking at that um, in terms of um, full node privacy. But yeah, in general, I think if if you are able to figure out how to run a full node, or even if you know someone. Uh, that runs a full node that you can connect to instead of using a light wallet service. Um, that is a vast, a vast improvement for your privacy in that regard. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 taken me myself, you know, uh, a couple of weeks till I had it all set up with my node. It's really become much more user friendly. UX as automatic updates, you know, you buy like a, whatever for a hundred bucks, like a software premium, and it just does does the upgrade updating by itself. So. It's really it comes boils down to again to the usability to you know to the empathetical technology that uh, you know so a lot of things are happening um, yeah so I'm, I'm also looking forward to your podcast that you have announced on on Twitter coming soon on privacy counter surveillance surveillance digital rights cyberpunk punks uh, and cyberpunk literature you want to uh, tell my, our listeners and viewers a little bit about that. Yeah, I, I'm still figuring this one out because um, for anyone who's who's listened to me on my other podcast, Block Digest, um, you've probably noticed by now that I tend to focus on privacy-related stories a lot um, when it comes to Bitcoin or just things that could affect Bitcoiners that aren't necessarily Bitcoin-related. And um, I think there's, I've just realized that there's a lot more to cover in that area that may be useful to people um, outside of Bitcoin that maybe is not being covered in just the general discussion about um, how to improve your privacy and stuff like that. So I, I've been thinking a long time about creating just a separate um, audio podcast just for that topic and going into other things as well, such as um, cyberpunk literature, like a kind of like a, a book review type thing. I'm not sure how it's going to look but um, yeah, that's that's uh, something I want to do in the future, and I'm working on getting that started. But it's not it's not uh, it's not going to be available for a while. Yeah, I think your work is really underrated, uh, Janine. Really, I don't want to blow your horn, but it's you 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 guys are doing really great great work, God's work probably, because there's I mean there's really uh, just a handful of people who who are so do you know uh, do so such a you know incredible due diligence research, investigative journalism, you know background checks, uh, source verification, and you know education uh, at the end of the day. So thank you so much again, Janine, and hope we can repeat this in the very near future. Yeah, and I uh, I do because uh, um, you know with everything that's going on with uh, Zoom in the past couple of months, I I now feel kind of obligated to just mention some things about Zoom because that that is being used here, and so for anyone who's wondering why I, I'm uh, why I'm I'm willing to use Zoom, it's because I'm using the the browser version. Um, I don't I don't ever install Zoom, and I'm never going to install Zoom ever. But um, you should definitely look into kind of the. Uh, the, the global implications of Zoom and the fact that so many people are using it and uh, they in particular have a pretty bad um, or they have had recently some pretty uh, anti-encryption uh, stances which they have kind of backtracked on which is very good. Um, but yeah, like even when it comes to non-Bitcoin stuff, you should just be aware of you know the services that you're using and the stances they take because they may actually not be beneficial to your privacy and you should always be aware of that fantastic well janine stephanie want to say something before we wrap up thank you so much janine that was really fascinating yep good to be here all right janine thank you so much have a good day yep. talk to you soon bye 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 All right, um, let's do some final wrap up because we're still recording. No, okay, I'm, I'm gonna wrap up. Um, so again, um, I really appreciate, you know, Janine's work. She just, she just does, you know, incredible work in the background and for, for so many years now, she's one of the really, uh, 
uh, <laughs> she belongs really to extinct species of investigative journalism and breaks down things. So check out her, her Twitter handle. Uh, make sure you follow her on her, um, uh, you know, uh, subscribe to her newsletters. Uh, podcast going to come up soon, hopefully. And uh, privacy is really important. You know, start coin joining, educate yourself. There's a bunch of materials out there, podcasts, literature, articles, books, uh, videos. Um, or, you know, you can go on, uh, keep it simple, Bitcoin, Bitcoin Q&A, uh, they're just, you know, BTC sessions, uh, you know, go really into the practical, technical things, uh, uh, set up your, your harder wallet if you have one, you know, withdraw your money, for, uh, all the Bitcoin from your, from the exchange, try to do as much as possible, non-KYC, peer-to-peer exchanges, uh, set up your full node, uh, connect all your wallets to your full node, uh, or your Samurai wallet to your dojo. So you can do a lot of things, uh, educate also your friends, neighbors, family members, uh, please uh, distribute this video, all my other podcast interviews I've done um, on, 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 on my podcast platform, my YouTube channel, please uh, make sure you follow me, you subscribe, leave me a positive review, so it would help me greatly. Thanks again to uh, Stephanie von Jan as my co-host, and again to my special guest, Janine, J9, uh, Ro Rome, uh, or R-O-E-M uh, on Twitter handle. So I'm going to put those all in the show notes. Thank you so much again for your support and listening. And if you are an ethical Bitcoin sponsor, please get in touch with me. I really would love to expand, do this, do these uh, interviews, these snippets, uh, these uh, also, you know, more investigative work on all kinds of uh, topics, not only, you know, specifically Bitcoin, but beyond that uh, um, and, and do this, you know, in multiple languages at least in german and english so thank you so much again and i'll see you soon again take care